your girl, Gibby Nakasa, and you are listening to Guildcast. Guildcast is a weekly podcast series based on the three pillars of the Graphic Artists Guild, advocacy, community, and business resources. Keep listening to learn more about the Graphic Artists Guild and visit our website at www.graphicartistsguild.org. Streamline your conversation to one platform, which is why I love email after the initial kickoff, because not only is it in one location, you can actually search it, but you can actually have a paper trail to say, wait, no, you said you wanted red, not blue, so... Guildcast is brought to you in part by Graphic Arts Today. This week's resources episode is a throwback to a webinar by Chrissy and Liz as they talk mistakes I've made in our Ask a Pro series. Welcome to the Graphic Artist Guild's Ask a Pro series. I'm longtime member Ed Shems. You can find me everywhere at Ed Fred Ned. Um, so some of our past free Ask a Pro webinars have been copyright basics, social media for illustrators, business basics, Ask a Cartoonist, publishing. So welcome to the Mistakes I've Made uh, Ask a Pro webinar. Um, if you want, you can check out, I'm going to post a link right now. Uh, afterwards, you can check out this link for other free Ask a Pro webinars. You just click at the very top ask a pro and it'll filter all the uh the various webinars i was about to say ask a pro webinars but i've said that so many times in a row um now if you uh check out that link you can watch for free and we also as the guild we have monthly guild webinars which are free for members and open to non-members for a fee now you may be wondering who the graphic arts guild is and i'll just tell you real fast um, the primary purpose is to help our members compete effectively in an ever-changing field uh, we do this through teaching through advocacy work and through community and it's been a wonderful organization i've been a part of it for oh probably about 25 years so that kind of tells you around how old i am but not exactly so at the bottom of your screen you can see a chat feature and I hope you can all see that. If you can't see it, chat at me that you can't see it. That was a joke. So now I'd like to welcome you all to, oh, and by the way, I'll be taking questions during the webinar. You can chat them in, uh, you can type them in and I'll be taking them. And we have times uh, within the presentation where I can ask certain questions, but if something is right, uh, needs to be asked right away, I'm sure Liz and Chrissy won't mind me butting in. So speaking of whom, the two people nodding up there, um, you, the one on the left, that's uh, Chrissy, and I'm gonna work real hard on her last name. Meschieri has been a freelance graphic designer specializing in branding, advertising, and illustration for six years, and in the industry for over 10 years. And she currently works out of Rocket City, USA, which is Huntsville, Alabama. Great name. She has collaborated with clients, including Chameleon Cold Brew, NPR and Discovery Inc., which is the parent company of Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, and other notable networks. She has a passion for design and apparently an unhealthy, unhealthy obsession with Nutella. Uh, you can find her at zacrezy.com and Instagram. Uh, you can find her at zacrezy also on Instagram. Um, and then over on our right, with the very serene background, uh, Liz DeFiori has been a freelance illustrator for just over a year, specializing in children's picture book illustration, who also does middle grade illustration, video and board games, and other commissions. She loves working on stories with personal and emotional impact that display kids and or adults dealing with big emotions and interpersonal relationships. In addition to being a member of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, Liz is the New England Regional Representative for the Graphic Arts Guild. And you can find her on Twitch at Lizzie by Design. So I'd like to welcome both of you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I'm also gonna mention that Erin Harris is in the background working our slides and she has been instrumental in putting this together, so thank you. And then we also have Paula uh, who we couldn't do any of this without. So without any further ado, let's jump in. We have a, a, a great list of um, things that we're gonna be talking about. So let's jump in, say hello. <laughs> Hello, and thank you, Ed. Okay, so um, let's start with the basics. 
And I'm just going to let you guys kind of self-guide a little bit, but I'll be jumping in as well. And I'll be keeping an eye on the chat. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to, to chat it right in. Yeah. So, um, just to, just to start off, one of the, one of the mistakes that I made right at the beginning of my illustration career was actually in naming my, my business. Um, so I used the, the, um, handle Lizzie by design. Uh, and I put a lot of thought into this name, (laughs) but it didn't occur to me that, um, as a primary, primarily I'm an illustrator and it didn't occur to me that, um, people might expect me to be a designer primarily because I put design in my, in my name. Um, so it was it, the, when we were in talks uh, at the beginning when we were planning this. It just kind of like came up as one of those things of what's one of the most basic mistakes that a young professional might make at the beginning of their career. <laughs> like it's too late to change it, or is that something that you might you're considering revising? I mean, you're only a year into uh, to your freelance career. Yeah, you know, I actually decided that I still really like it <laughs> despite. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I might keep it for a little while. And then um, uh, maybe as I'm becoming published, I might just change it, the brand to be just my name. Um, but it, but for now, I decided to keep it. Okay. And Chrissy. Actually out of sentimentality. <laughs> <laughs> Already a year in. Um, <laughs> Chrissy, your, yours is a really interesting name as well. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that real fast? Yeah, so apparently I like picking names that are both unpronounceable and difficult to spell. Um, <laughs> the benefit of having a name that's very unique, so I spell my Chrissy Mischetti. You might be able to see it in the back there, too. It's a very, very unique name, um, which is great because you come up really quickly when anybody searches your name. But that's assuming that they know how to spell it correctly. Uh, so since I've been doing freelancing for over six years now, uh, there's actually you know some merit behind keeping my last name, Miss Kitty, as my business name, uh, which I will be formally doing starting in January, uh, just because I do have, I don't want to call it a reputation, but folks know that name now and they know, you know, we've joked about not being able to spell it and all that. So it's helpful for me because people can find it once they know how to spell it. If not, I've got the shortened Zuck Crazy, um, which is also difficult apparently to spell, but it leads them very quickly to where they need to go. Um, so naming is probably something you're going to stress out about for one, two, six, ten years. Um, but as long as you're doing work and people know how and where to find you and you're very consistent about that, you should be good to go. Great. And uh, what can you say about what is an EIN? Do you- good question. <laughs> Chrissy, you want to take that one? identification number? That's correct. It's essentially like your social security number, but not as dire if you lose it. <laughs> Right. Well, it's not only so you don't lose it. I'll be filling in a few gaps here. Yeah. Right. Um, it's not only that. It's uh, if, you, if you use your social security number everywhere, then at some point it will get stolen and someone will buy a house. Mm-hmm. So use, when someone sends you a W-9 form, which is the form that you fill out that they use to then file taxes uh, and to prove that they paid a uh, contractor money, um, then that goes to the IRS, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to be giving that W-9 out to all your clients. Um, so if it has your social security number, it's le- it's you're, you're sending it out all over the place. And EIN is a safer way. It connects directly to your social security, but without using that number. Um, so you can sign up for it. Make sure that when you do that, that you hold on to that number because it's almost impossible to, you know, ask them to send you the number again, you know, um, but that's a really important, simple, simple, simple thing you can do to just safeguard yourself. The reason we were, I was joking about that at the beginning is because they brought this up yesterday and I didn't know what it was. (laughs) So I actually put on my to-do list to get an EIN this week. (laughs) Great. that's what that's what we're here for. We're all here to learn from each other and and bounce things off of each other and find out new things, all that stuff. Yeah, there's no shame in making mistakes with, as you're starting your career. Don't don't let that scare you off from doing things. I mean, the intern who sold the swoosh to Nike for thirty five dollars, I think it was. Mm-hmm. I'm sure she, you know, regrets that to some degree, but has moved on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we'll move on to uh, the bank accounts. Yeah, so the benefit of having a separate bank account is it makes it a lot easier to keep track of your expenses. So if you buy a pen, 
you know that this pen was for business. And so once it comes time to tax season, you can expense it very easily. You just look in one spot. Um, it's also easier just to have one location where all your payments are going. And then you can give yourself a salary where you kind of move money around. Um, but it just really helps you keep things in one line. When you go you know, Target, in my case, to buy office supplies, you pull out one card versus the other. Um, and it just makes it really easy to keep track versus trying to separate out you know, your avocados from your pens and your receipt. <laughs> And um, kind of like leading into the tracking expenses, uh, you should be tracking your expenses mm-hmm. every month. Um, you should you should have a profit and loss statement. So learn how to do one of those. It's not as hard and scary as it might sound. You can get a really easy template on Google Forms for how to do this. Um, balance sheets are a little bit trickier. Also very nice to have, but not absolutely necessary at the start. But a profit and loss statement you should have and having a separate bank account will make it exponentially easier to track your expenses every month. Knowing what money is coming in and what money is going out is very important to determining whether or not you have a business, (laughs) whether or not it can support itself. (laughs) And by tracking expenses, you, you know, I have a cigar box. No, I'm old. I have a cigar box. And in that I throw in all my, uh, receipts after I've entered them into uh, my accounting software. And there, there are some free ones out there. There's one called Wave uh, that, that is free unless you want to do X, Y, or Z. Um, but it's, it's free software and you just put all your information in there. And then I just keep everything in a cigar box for the year and then throw it into a uh, an envelope for seven years and then toss it after seven years. <laughs> yeah. This is and my cigar box back here. Oh, so they buy receipts and deposits and stuff like that. God, you don't want to see. My you own. can even. <laughs> You can even just like the the way that I keep receipts is literally by taking a picture of them with my phone. Mm -hmm. And I just have like a folder of photos for receipts. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm messy with papers, but, but I don't have receipts. (laughs) You know, things that we learned along the way. My mistake the first year was I put everything in one pile where then I had to separate out, you know, my receipts versus my deposited checks versus, you know, expenses for business. Like it was all just in one giant pile in the corner of the room. And so that's where, you know, over time you learn what organization skills you need to keep it all on track. And God forbid if you move, those those papers, yeah. they're gone. You're never going to see those again. It doesn't matter how good you are at packing. <laughs> so what kind of expenses do you actually track for your business? Um, I track, I use a couple of software where I pay for it. So like Dropbox and Box. Um, oh, there's a few other Adobe. Pay for Adobe. Uh, your phone bill, your, I work from home. So the square footage of this office gets detracted. Um, so just keeping track of all of those expenses. Um, and yeah, if I'm buying art supplies, um, the guild membership, actually, I uh, mm-hmm. use a, a do a business expense for that. If I'm going to be attending conferences as a children's illustrator, I tend to attend a lot of events. Um, and so um, guests uh, and food and such re- directly relating to the attending of those events mm-hmm. are expenses that I track. And I use an app called Mile IQ, which will literally track where I've been with my car. And then I can Ooh, either that's swipe. A cool idea. Yeah, swipe left if it's for business, swipe right if it's personal, or something like that. Um, and then I at the end of the year, you just print it out. Yeah, you just print it out and then you take it over to your account and say, this is you know the mileage that I used for my car. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. It's very, that is very cool. Helpful. <laughs> oh, I have to remember that. I just put that in the chat. Yeah, I like you. <laughs> Um, And a a quick comment, you mentioned an accountant. We will be getting to that near the mm -hmm. end of the presentation, talking about accountants and whether or not you need them. Guildcast is a weekly podcast series based on the three pillars of the Graphic Artists Guild, advocacy, community, and business resources. Keep listening to learn more about the Graphic Artists Guild and visit our website at www.graphicartistsguild.org. So uh, I assume that you use contracts, right? (laughs) No. We'll dive into more of that. For everything. I don't hate myself that much not to use a contract. (laughs) I did once. (laughs) Never again. Biggest mistake there, yeah. (laughs) Um, Do you want to... Is this where we get into it? I... Yeah, we can can get into it. Contracts are extremely Why don't we get into... um, Go ahead. Um... 
Uh, yeah, so I uh, I just took um, the con- one of the contract templates that the guild provides to their members, and I read through it and then just modified a few sections of it to um, the project or the situation that I was specifically involved in, but the guild provides some really amazing templates, mm-hmm. and they're all, like, lawyer vetted. Um Go ahead, Chrissy. (laughs) Yeah, no, same thing. So my contracts have evolved very much over time, but at the heart of it, what it always includes is who you're doing work for, what that work is, and how much they're expected to pay you for it. Um, At the very minimum, that's the best things that you can have on there. And then over time, you know, just two months ago, I added another little bit that will now be in all my future contracts, just so that way... It's basically a great way to make sure everyone's on the same page. You know, it's not supposed to be anything scary. It legitimizes you as a company and as a freelancer where, yes, you have a contract. This is what I'm promising you and this is what you're promising me. And that's essentially what it is. Awesome. So we're going to get into contracts a little more um, in another section coming up. Um, Aaron, behind the scenes mentioned also Lyft has, uh, you can have a business account and you can tell it when you're doing a business ride versus a a personal ride. That's really cool. Um, There's just so much going on out there. (laughs) Um, So why don't we just uh, touch up, touch on the set up a website part. Um, How, so I just want to ask Liz, so you're a year in, how, how early on did you have a website? Did you have one before you were a freelancer or? yeah, I set up I set up my website, um, I or at least I began setting up my website as soon as I had made the decision that I was going to be freelancing full time. Um, my my husband is a programmer, so I was able to get some free work out of this. <laughs> but um, you don't have to have a programmer set up a website for you. It can just be really basic information, but it is so incredibly essential to have that basic information available online, not as a Facebook page, something that people can go to regardless of social, having a social media account. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I had, I had had places like, um, Behance or ArtStation or, uh, DeviantArt a long time ago, um, that where my portfolio was and you could find information on how to contact me, um, before I started freelancing full time. And then when I decided to make it a business, I formalized that into my own website. Okay. Chris, you want to talk? Yeah, so I actually set up my website for the first time when I was in school. I took a web design course as part of my program. Um, and so we had to hand code it. And the great thing about that was I learned how to hand code it. And I realized I'm not a web designer, not a coder, not any of that. The only downside, and that was my big mistake, was I made it so difficult for myself to actually keep up with my website that I didn't touch it for over five years. <laughs> and so this year, for the first time, I actually switched everything from being hand coded with duct tape in the background uh, to using Squarespace and something that I can actually go in and instantly update, add new projects as they get released versus this daunting task of having to manually code it in. Um, and that has been the biggest mistake I've done for my what my own self and my own website was not making it easy for me, myself because there's no reason why not to make it easy. Yeah, I use WordPress uh, for mine. So even though my husband did some coding on it, I'm able to edit all of the aspects of my site fairly easily within the, the WordPress backend. Right. These days, these days, there's so many different websites you can go to that are so easy to set up. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they take a little bit of money. Uh, Squarespace, Wix, for example. Mm-hmm. But for anyone who's looking for an a inexpensive, well, actually free place to actually just start out, um, you shouldn't squat there for too long just by itself. But um, Behance is a great place to be as well. It's... Um, it's you have free portfolios in there and you can point people to your domain which would be you know on behance.net slash whatever your name might be mm-hmm. so that's a good and depending thing. depending on what industry you want to um you want to do art professionally in uh, a lot of places will comb websites like behance or art station or mm-hmm. deviant art um uh, for new talent. So even if they're not finding your website, it's still like, it's still a good idea to have some things. Like if you already are on Behance, just put your portfolio there. It's It takes like five minutes to put some images up. You don't have to like keep it super updated, but it's still good to have a presence there even if you have a very nice website. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think we'll talk about this later too, but the best advice I've ever gotten is show the work that you want to get. 
Um, yes. So like I said, I'm not a web designer. I would love to never do web again. So I would be doing myself a disservice if I only showed web projects. Um, so instead, recently I started, well, recently, in the last couple of years, I started showing more illustration work. And then that led to me actually becoming an illustrator properly, where I was actually doing more illustration-based projects um, as you know, the main project versus just here and there as a part of a larger project. Yeah. So you're so right. I, I remember um, hearing a, an artist talk about he did a drawing with where someone was wearing leopard skin uh, pants or something, and then just started getting all these leopard jobs. You know? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. so, so people, sometimes you do need to hit people over the head. Look, I can do people showing emotions mm -hmm. and I can do animals but and that's that's great um, as long as you show them within the industry that you want where you want to get the work and Chrissy mm -hmm. you're so right I wrote that in all caps in the chat box show the work you want to get and you know if you're trying to be a, a, a picture book illustrator then you show various things not just not just animals because that's all the work you're going to get you're going to get mm -hmm. only animal picture books you show yeah. everything and people will consider you for everything. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a good time to just kind of pause for some questions. Um, I think everyone's just listening so intently. Uh, if I see anyone start to type, we'll stop. But otherwise, I think we're just going to move on. Anyone want to ask any particular question about setting up your business, um, about being organized? I think that was one of the most important things you guys said. Mm -hmm. You must be organized, and I am the most disorganized person. And it took me a while to get my act together um, and make sure that my files were exactly were something that I could search out or find quickly for my clients. And now, you know, I have clients who who write to me ten years later, and they're like, "Do you still have my logo?" Of course I do. Here you go. You know, mm -hmm. so things like that are so important. But also, the bookkeeping is incredibly important. But you know, it should not scare you. If you're still in school, you know, this is the time to start learning. You still have, if you're a senior, you still have half a year to just kind of slowly dip your feet into the water and, and look around for apps that will help you. And, you know, watch the webinars like this one that will kind of tell you what you don't know. And I think we're going to continue on here and we'll talk about things, more things that perhaps you don't know or that you'd like some clarification on. So let's jump into part two, running your business. Um, so Liz, I, I want to ask Liz this question because she's so fresh. Um, how did you get your first client? Oh, that was cool, actually. Um, you know how everybody, you know how everybody always says, oh, it's it's the networks that you make, especially when you're in school. Yeah, um, that's that's true. <laughs> I didn't realize how true it was until 100%. I launched my website. I posted it on Facebook and Twitter and all that. Hey guys, I'm freelance now. And this um this woman who I went to college with was not friends with. We had moved in the similar circles, but we're not friends. We were only friends on Facebook. She saw that I had um, made this move. She checked out my website, emailed me through my website, and it turns out she was starting a video game company and really wanted to use my art style for their, their first um, to-be-published video game. Um, and uh, she, she had um, a, a very reasonable budget for the thing that she wanted to do. They wanted to get their... Um, uh, the company is called Burn Phase. You can look it up. Um, and uh, they, they wanted their tutorial level of their first game to be up to polished standards so that they could then um, pitch it and get more money to make the rest of the video game, which happens a lot within the, the indie game industry. Um, so that was my first big client project. Like I, I had like a couple of like $60 commissions and stuff like that. Um, but that, that, that was really cool. It, um, it was just this person that I knew through college, but didn't know very well. Um, just kind of kept a bit of a connection with and, she happened to have a project that was just perfect for what I was attempting to do. So can I assume that you were posting images on your personal social media pages like Facebook and such? And that's how she, I mean. Yeah, I was. Okay. Uh, when you first start out, like tell your friends and family what you're doing, show them what you're doing. Don't be ashamed of it in the slightest. Um, 
because they're like, even if your friends and family don't have projects for you, which is fine, they're going to want to share your stuff and they might know people, you know, it's that six degrees of separation thing. It's true. You might meet Kevin Bacon. <laughs> you might meet Kevin Bacon. <laughs> How cool would that be? Right? Tracy, really? How'd you get your profile? Um, yeah, so I'm actually going to answer that question twice. The first client I got when I was still in school, I went to school for graphic design. I got a BFA, and every once in a while, we'd get emails about companies looking for students to do some work. Um, it was paid work, which was super exciting as a college student. Because you're like, hey, I can eat more than ramen tonight. That's exciting. Uh, but I would always say yes to all of those projects that came through. Um, and through that, I actually started working with a client to do my first paid logo, which was super exciting because he knew someone who needed help with another logo. And that person actually knew someone who needed a logo and branding for an entire festival. Um, so because of that, you were able to actually see the track of that network kind of growing. And that person refers you to somebody else to somebody else. And that one little tiny project that was your first logo, spent way too long on, actually snowballed into a much larger, much more exciting project. And then how I got my first job was actually, I went to a portfolio review that was happening on campus and I didn't realize it at the time, but what they were actually doing was interviewing for potential future hires. Um, I realized that by the third person I was talking to during the portfolio review, because they were getting like, so where do you see yourself in five years? And what are your strengths and weaknesses? I'm like, these questions sound really familiar. <laughs> um, so by the time I got to the third guy, I was like, well, my strengths and weaknesses are X, Y, and Z. And I speak Spanish and, you know, I'm a graphic designer and I love watching television. And she actually turned out to work for Discovery um, and hired me on in their international department to do graphics for um, Discovery and all their networks. And so taking every Every single opportunity as an opportunity is how I actually landed both of my first projects and my first job. Um, so if I have any words of wisdom for you guys, even though you're in school, you are actually like at the precipice of your career if you just take a bunch of chances and just go for it. Great. And uh, we're going to segue into, into point number three here. Is that, and then we'll go, go back to two, um, is that how you get most of your clients Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all word of mouth. And so one person refers me to another, or as people leave companies and move jobs over time, I've actually had one person go to three different jobs and take me with them as a freelancer to all the jobs that they've gone to. You know, and that says a lot about um, your professionalism too. I, I, I think I'm not sure that we're going to be able to jump into that enough uh, during this, but, you know, um, treating your business like it's a business mm -hmm. as opposed to a hobby is really mm -hmm. important. It's, and that, you know, the organization you were talking about before uh, is so important and also your customer service and, and all of that. So if, if a client keeps you on for, you know, more than one project, then you're doing something right. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong if you only get one project because that happens quite a lot. Yeah. But that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, so I'm just, I'm going to pick up the pace just a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to give each of you like maybe uh, two minutes on what's your process when you start working with a new client. Um, and we'll start with Chrissy. Yeah. So first off I'll get, let's say it's an email in my inbox. I will then respond and ask them to set up a kickoff meeting. Usually I do it video just because as you can tell, I use my hands a lot and that way they can actually see me using my hands and understand. Um, after that I will kind of take all the notes during the during the kickoff and then put together a proposal and then a contract that I send over to them for approval. Um, once they receive the signed contract and the deposit, we start working on the project. Um, and that's usually how I get started. I'll also go through and set up my uh, folder organization if it's a brand new client or I set up the new folder within the folder for the client um, to get all of those files organized right off the bat. Really important. I I don't need two minutes. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Not always a video call. Sometimes it's a phone call. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes it happens just through email. I prefer not. I prefer to have like the phone call or the video call. It's so much easier to have a lot of questions answered through conversation mm -hmm. instead of just through um, email or God forbid text messaging, which I've done before. Never again, never again. Um, <laughs> Streamline your conversation to one platform, which is why I love email after the initial kickoff because not only is it in one location, you can actually search it, but you can actually have a paper trail to say, wait, no, you said you wanted red, not blue. So 
Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. When, when it's a, a voice or a um, video conversation, do you take type notes? No, I take handwritten notes um, because typing... I, I can't do both at the same time, but handwriting, yes. And then I will actually transcribe those into an email and send it to them um, to say, hey, can you agree that this is what we talked so about? Kind of, like a, sure. kind of like a design brief. Yeah. Um, and also just to make sure, like, even if it's rounds of revisions and I have a client that loves talking on the phone, I will write <laughs> everything down and say, hey, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly and I didn't miss anything. Please let me know. Because it's for my benefit, too. I don't want to realize that they said they actually wanted strawberries instead of blueberries. Um, <laughs> that'll actually save me hours of time if I just get it right right at that moment. <laughs> yeah, I do the same thing. I, I hand write my notes and then transcribe them. It's for whatever reason, it's just so much easier to concentrate on what they're saying yeah. when I'm handwriting instead of typing. And then I'll put them into their own folders. So I've got my own notes pages, but well, the client project date, and then who I'm talking to. And I just sort it into their file. Okay. Um, first of all, Monica, would you mind turning off your camera, please? Um, but all this you're saying, like, th this takes away from my work. This takes away from me designing or illustrating. Like, why can't I just jump in and design and illustrate and, and not be, you know, not send notes to my clients and all that stuff? Like, why are you doing all this? Because for that one moment, you <laughs> doubt if they said strawberry or blueberry, you can just go back and look at your notes. <laughs> like, it's going to happen. You're going to think, oh, I got this. I remember this. I remember this. And then you're like, oh, my God, what did they say? And then you don't look professional because you have to go back and ask them something that you talked about already. Um, so just having everything written down, you know, there's no assumptions and you don't make mistakes. <laughs> And in my experience, especially with the one-off commission type clients, they they think they know exactly what they want and have told you exactly what they want. And throughout conversation, you will find out that not to be the case. <laughs> they actually want something very different and have not yet realized it. <laughs> okay, so, so let's segue this over to um, what are some of the mistakes you've made working with clients? Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples that, that might maybe even connect with what we were just talking about? Yeah, one was not asking them enough questions during the kickoff meeting, especially for logos. Sometimes people say, oh, I want a logo that has, you know, a wrench. It's like, okay, great. But it's our job as the illustrator, and I'm talking, that's, you know, a branding project. But let's say it's an illustration project as well. Uh, I have a client that says, oh, I want to, you know, be shoveling because... I like to shovel. It's like, okay. It's our job as the creative to ask them, you know, why? What does that mean to you? Um, you know, what does shoveling represent to you? And then you dig into it and you realize, oh, they actually want to show that they know how to uncover mysteries, but they don't work outside. They actually work, in, work indoors with microscopes. So maybe a microscope is more fitting. And you just have that conversation and open it up together to have the most effective piece for them at the end of the project. So are you, would you call yourself... Uh, someone who's working for someone or more like of a partner really because because you're you're interested in their success you're not there just to make a quick buck mm -hmm. um, you're, you're you're invested you even if you're not invested in this company you're invested in their in their success because you know because you care I assume that you you care to create great work for them um, but you also in the end you might actually get some more work out of it either from them or from being recommended because you were thoughtful in your in, in your briefs yeah uh, and also just, go ahead. oh sorry Chris. no I was just gonna say and ending up where they actually thought that they wanted to be um, if that makes sense so they may have thought that they what they were envisioning was a shovel but what they actually were envisioning was a microscope or something like that and they just didn't realize that yeah um, yeah each month, Guildcast features episodes based on advocacy, community, and business resources. This week's episode from our Guild Resources is a past webinar featuring Chrissy Meschieri and Liz DeFiore. Ask a Pro Mistakes I've Made Part 1. Chrissy is a designer illustrator living in Huntsville, Alabama, who is also an associate rep for our South region. And Liz DeFiore is an illustrator and aspiring writer in Massachusetts, who is also our New England region representative. So the, the question uh, was mistakes that we've made in, in dealing with clients, right? That's correct. Um, doing business over text message was the worst experience business-wise <laughs> that 
<laughs> dealing with a client. Um, and it was for a political cartoon too. Uh, so it was, it, it just got so much more complicated than it was originally billed. And, um, it, there's so much, uh, there, there's so much um, misconstruing that can happen when you're doing that. The client was insisting on doing this over text message. Like she, she, she wasn't saying we have to do it over text message, but she wouldn't respond to me through any other channel. Um, and, uh, and at the time I was trying to get a contract together, but she wasn't really interested in that. So there wasn't a contract. It was really just, Oh, my word is good. Like, and it was through text message. So I had a record and, and I thought that would be okay. Um, and it just, it was a, it was a small nightmare getting through that project. It just, the scope increase happened, um, like scope creep. <laughs> that's that's a, a thing that happens. Um, who was going to be paying me was not clear. I thought it would be clear at the beginning. Turns out it was much more complicated than I thought. I did get paid at the end, but it was just, it, it was such a hassle. Like I never want to work with that client again. Um, I don't know what her impression of working with me was. It seems like it was good because she still talks about how much she likes the project, but um, it, it, it even turned into a project that I never wanted to have in my portfolio. And I specifically asked her not to mention that I had done. It was, it, it was just like the worst with the exception of I still got paid. So <laughs> it, it could have been worse, but it was pretty bad. <laughs> Coming up on this episode of Guildcast. If they refuse to show up on a video call for me, that's a pretty good indication that's a scammer. Um, and it's a good way to just, you know, in Liz's case, she actually investigated um, and invested a lot of time in it. But sometimes if you're really crunched for time, you don't have the time, but you do want to make sure it is a potential project that might lead to something. Um, you just shoot out that email to set up the web conference. And if they refuse, or in one case, the guy skipped it twice, it's like, okay, you're now wasting my time. Even if this was a project, clearly you're not going to be someone responsible because you're already missing our kickoff meetings, let alone, you know, when I need to hear revisions from you or, you know, the contract or the deposit. Um, so people who waste your time for me are big red flags and I'd rather just not have to work with them if I can avoid it. Join the Graphic Artists Guild to listen to the full version of this episode at www.graphicartistsguild.org. Thanks for listening to Guildcast. Coming up in next week's episode. People within themselves need to know what they can take on or, you know, you take on a certain amount and you can then be realistic with yourself and say, listen, I can't do this specific thing, but it's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not, it's not a fun situation to be working on a project with people who aren't interested because it's already hard enough to get people who are yeah. interested on board and to do things and to get things done with enthusiasm and ray, 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 because I don't want to have to dr drag you as a horse. Like I'm a human being like pulling a donkey. I'm not upon that bro. I'm not running down people. I've done that for so long that it's like. Guildcast is a weekly podcast series based on the three pillars of the graphic artists guild, advocacy, community, and business resources. Keep listening to learn more about the Graphic Artists Guild and visit our website at www.graphicartistsguild.org.